Welcome to Bios Ventures. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Widya Mali Asasa Smita, Senior Principal at B Capital Group, to the show. Widya, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Chris. I'm thrilled to be here. Let's kick things off. Can you share a brief personal intro with us, Widya? Yeah, sure. So I am a scientist by training. I did my undergrad in bioengineering and biomaterials, material science at UC Berkeley. And then I went on to get my PhD at Stanford, also in bioengineering. And then from there, because I have been attracted to this intersection between science and business, um, the first job that I had was at McKinsey. So it is a global management consulting group. And really, it was at McKinsey that I learned about the best practices of business. But then at McKinsey, I also felt that I was getting pulled away from innovation. So I ended up joining Johnson & Johnson Innovation in the New Ventures Group. Mm -hmm. uh, so Johnson & Johnson Innovation is a partnering arm of j, j And then after a few years at j, j I started to feel the startup itch myself. So I jumped into the startup world. Uh, I was the founding chief business officer at Intervent Biosciences. It is a company that is focusing on precision diagnostics and un also unlocking uh, glycoproteomics using mass spec and AI. Hmm. Um, and then from there, I spent a, a brief stint as a inter an interim chief business officer at Excella. This is a, an antibody discovery company. And then from there, I jumped into the venture world, first at Red Tree VC, and then now uh, at Me Capital. I can't wait to dive deeper and learn more about your background. What a truly incredible journey. Uh, but before doing that, would you mind just giving us, so we can provide context for the audience, a brief intro to B Capital as well? Of course. So B Capital is a global multi-stage investment firm. And our philosophy is to back entrepreneurs uh, that are hoping to shape the world uh, using technology. So we are an active partner when we invest in entrepreneurs and we focus on several industries within the firm. Uh, so ranging from enterprise solutions, software, data solutions, AI, ML, uh, to FinTech and also insured tech, to healthcare, as well as um, logistics and transportation. So as a firm, uh, we were founded in 2015, so it's been seven years, and we manage about $6.5 billion altogether, and our portfolio has 150 companies and counting. So I specifically sit within the healthcare group, and, um, and within the healthcare group, I focus on life science investments. And one thing uh, that is worth noting about B Capital is that we are a strategic partner to BCG. So what that means is through the BCG network, our portfolio companies can also reach into large corporations and also start thinking about how to uh, aspire to be a, a com companies that have best practices in management as well. What a strong advantage for those startups. Lucky enough to be your portfolio companies. I'm excited to learn more. And going to start by turning it over to my colleague, Sarah, to ask and learn a little bit more about your background, Woody, as well as, importantly, your journey to VC and B Capital today. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for those wonderful intros. We'd love to dive deeper and discuss your journey. You've been a founder and a consultant, worked in pharma and biotech, and now venture. Truly an incredible career. And at least Professionally, it all started when you pursued bioengineering in academia as both an undergrad at UC Berkeley and a PhD student at Stanford. I'd love to start here, right from the beginning. Why bioengineering? What brought you to bio? Yeah, what an amazing question. Honestly, when I was starting to think about what to major in undergrad, uh, I did not know that bioengineering would lead me into biotech, life sciences, and, and now venture. So back then, this was in the early 2000s, and no mention of AI, no CRISPR. So I was mostly just following my curiosity about living system. I think the defining moment for me was when I looked at the picture of a cell. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. It's basically that cartoon that everybody knows now with all the organelles and the compartments within a cell. So I was highly intrigued by that. So that was the beginning of my interest in bioengineering. 
And the reason why I chose bioengineering as opposed to mo more pure biology or, or molecular biology was I also like the component of design and also creating something new based on this mystery of biology. So basically turning that mystery into mastery. And now if we think about how far this field has come and the interdisciplinary nature of it and what it means in terms of human health, um, it is really just amazing to think about how rewarding this has been, this journey. And I think this is something that would resonate with a lot of our listeners within the BIOS community. I cannot think of um, any other domain where you get to, to satisfy your int intellectual curiosity and at the same time impact human health. And if you do two things right in terms of just uh, thinking about creating companies, build a great team, create products that would then um, impact clinical outcomes, the financial reward will come automatically. So it's just been so rewarding and bioengineering is really uh, a discipline that is that is just amazing from various angles. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Mystery to mastery is the goal always. With that background and context, let's dive a little bit uh, deeper. You jump from corporate to startup before entering venture. Across that arc in your career, what has been your North Star, the common thread that ties all of your work together? Yeah, this question is a good one because it made me reflect more deeply. And I would say that the common thread has been this intersection between innovation and business. So that also means that I am never too far away from startups. I love being at that meniscus with the creative tension between how you think about translating innovation into the commercial uh, realm. So that has been the common thread across my career. And if you think about life sciences and biopharma, it really takes a village going from concept to proof of concept and finally products. So um, this symbiotic relationship between academia, pharma, uh, startups, and also the investing community is just so strong because of the capital intensive nature of it. And also it's technic technically challenging, plus it's a regulated industry. So I've been fortunate to have had roles in each, uh, each of those buckets within the life science ecosystem. That's great. A lot of a lot of different experiences. Before focusing on your career in venture, I'd like to touch upon your role as a director of ventures with J and J Innovation, where you sourced and managed partnerships across the U.S. West Coast and Australia. Just based on that description, the role sounds very similar to venture. Can you tell us more about it? What were the major takeaways? Yeah, I would say that my career at J&J &J Innovation was quite transformative for me personally. Um, so J&J &J Innovation is the partnering arm for J&J, &J, as I mentioned earlier. It is also a place where the culture is great and the people are so capable and of high integrity. So it's really a great organization to be. Um, but really, I would say, as it relates to venture, there are three things that were really important to me uh, in terms of points of learning. So one is diligence. So beyond sourcing, diligence. Um, I would say that because J&J &J Innovation is affiliated or the sole purpose, one of the purposes is to feed into the R&D pipeline of J&J. &J. In our diligence, we really take a holistic approach in assessing an opportunities, not from just from the technical perspective, but also uh, across the spectrum of the product development journey. So you would bring in experts within j and and also outside, uh, looking at clinical development, looking at the commercial opportunity of it. So really the diligence is robust. And then second, and this is, um, this is something that is quite subtle, but it is so important in life sciences, is creative deal-making. So if you think about what's valuable to a startup, there are several things. So expertise is actually quite valuable to a, an emerging company. Capital, absolutely. And so in, in satisfying those things, there are deal currencies, if you will, that could be relevant. So equity investment is one 
licensing is another one, R&D collaboration. And when it comes to J&J, &J, there is also J Labs, which is the incubation arm. So it, at J&J, &J, we were able to mix and match those deal currencies to put together a package that would work for the startup as well as J&J. &J. And that's something that I take with me as I uh, journey through the venture um, chapter of my career. And then the third thing is, is really how to be a good partner because usually the, uh, the value is created after you have made the investment and after you have transacted the deal and really uh, being there on the ground day to day, troubleshooting with the companies and providing expertise. That was the third uh, piece of learning that I got from j, &J Innovation. So quite parallel to venture, I would say. That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing. You also served as Chief Business Officer of Excella and Intervent before you joined Red, Red Tree Venture Capital. There, you both invested in and helped launch biotech and med device companies. Can you tell us more about the transition? Was venture the natural next step in your career? The transition was quite smooth, I would say. And this goes back to my earlier discussion on this being a team effort and the ecosystem being just filled with professionals, uh, academics, investors, entrepreneurs, all working together at various points of the drug development journey. So the transition was not a hard one for me. Except that now in, in venture capital, you have strategic freedom to pursue investments that would fit within your investment thesis. And we also have responsibilities to our LPs, of course, that we need to be aware of. Very exciting. And lastly, from Red Tree, you joined B Capital Group in September 2021. Among potential venture firms, what prompted you to join B Capital and what was it like transitioning during the pandemic? Yeah, the transition during the pandemic was a was an interesting one, uh, but it was not too hard, I would say, and I will get to that point. But what attracted me to B Capital was uh, this, this mission or really philosophy of um, really positioning ourselves to be the most value adding investor on the cap table. So that's one big attraction. And that means that our interactions and our contributions go beyond the boardroom. And also uh, we are not just sitting behind our computers and looking at spreadsheets. We really want to be in the trenches together with the entrepreneurs. So that's one big attraction point for me. Um, the second big attraction point for me was the global nature of, uh, of B Capital. And the third is we were building, starting 2021, a dedicated healthcare team. And that healthcare team, what sets us apart from our peers is we are broad spectrum. So I focus on life sciences, but there is also a big um, side of the healthcare team that is focusing on digital health and health IT. So various points coming together for me. And it was really uh, an amazing uh, time to be despite the pandemic. So speaking about the pandemic, um, B Capital is a global firm and uh, the firm has eight locations around the world. So this remote collaboration setting has been the norm uh, ever since before the pandemic. But at the same time, we are also hyper local. So throughout my interviews with B Capital, I actually met one on one with uh, with the stakeholders within B Capital, and most of the interactions have been in person. And that's yeah. also how we carry forward in terms of uh, evaluating startups. We make it a soft requirement, but we are um, serious about it, at least within the healthcare team to meet the entrepreneurs in person we, before we wire the funds. So even though the world is remote these days, uh, human interactions in the physical world, it is something that we pay attention to quite closely. Oh, and that leads us well into our next topic, talking about your portfolio. And so as you've described briefly, B Capital seeks to invest in companies and technologies with the potential to digitize the world's most important industries agnostic of uh, geography. And in your role as part of the B Capital Life Science Healthcare team, you invest in biotech, bio IT, and innovative med tech. 
can you share a little bit more about your investment theses and maybe how B Capital arrived at those theses, as you talked about earlier? Yeah, it's an important question. So uh, when we think about our investment thesis development, there are three key pieces that we consider. First is the platform, so that's technology. Uh, second is the market and product readiness. And third is uh, whether or not it influences clinical outcomes and also healthcare. And this is specific to our healthcare investment thesis. So let me elaborate, at least uh, from the life sciences, bio IT, biotech perspective. So uh, the technology part, we look at companies with platform and also this underlying engine of uh, discovering more new drugs. Mm -hmm. And in that, we think about specifically how a company or uh, basically the thesis development can really address this problem of drugging um, undruggable targets with validated biology. And what that means is we can leverage all kinds of tools, computational or biological tools. So that's one. The second piece is uh, taking the modularity of biology and the fact that we can now program um, drugs and, and cells to take what has been um, discovered by the broader scientific community to create something that is new, going back to this hijacking biology to overcome and outsmart disease. So that's the second piece of our platform or technical consideration. And then with respect to the second bucket would be market readiness and also infrastructure readiness to absorb all the amazing uh, technology that comes out of the platform. And then third to that would be the clinical reality of it. If you really develop these things, can they influence clinical outcomes in a positive way? So those are quite abstract, but that's how we think about how we develop our investment thesis within life sciences and B Capital. And I think the last point, especially, will be informed by your experience with J&J, &J, thinking strategically there. And it's one where I know a lot of VCs put in time and thought and effort around the clinical aspect, but perhaps uh, there could be a greater emphasis, especially from the startup side earlier on. How do we really make sure clinical realities are possible for patients? Yeah, absolutely. And so not only are you investing across numerous domains in biology, as you just described, but B Capital also invests from the founding of the companies all the way through growth to IPO. And so given you invest across so many areas and so many stages of bio-innovation, how do you think about both differentiating your fund and then also developing and having that domain expertise? You talked a lot about being a collaborative team, so I assume that's part of it, but I'd love to learn more in your own words. Sure. So um, starting from the investment team members, our investment team members are domain experts in healthcare and other domains at B Capital. So within the healthcare team, our partners are experts in healthcare that have been breathing and living basically healthcare for their professional career. Robert Mittendorf, who is the head of healthcare, has been an investor in various aspects of uh, healthcare. So ranging from digital health to med tech to biotech for a long time. And he himself is the trained ER doctor and also a, an operator as a business development uh, leader at a med tech company. And then the other partner um, within our healthcare team, Adam Seabrook has been focusing on healthcare investments for many years. So we built domain expertise starting from that point in the way we source and diligence and advise companies. But uh, what is equally important would be what happens after we invest. So we, we draw in, resources from our platform team, from BCG. So BCG has a large healthcare practice. So we differentiate ourselves that way, both in, in terms of how we diligence and source companies, but also to support them uh, with this network of experts within and, and also external to B Capital leveraging BCG. That makes a lot of sense. And I would love to hear your thoughts Historically, the types of investments in tech and traditional biotech have been very different. But as you're talking about with the rise of platform technologies and the integration and interdisciplinary nature of uh, biotech research today, we've seen that convergence and the melding of technology and biology. So 
I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on this trend and where you see the next frontier, uh, especially of computation, having maybe the greatest impact on things like tech bio, digital health, life sciences, healthcare. Uh, I'm just curious to learn what you're excited by. Yeah, this element of data and computation, it is here. I think every single company should at least think about it. And there are different um, waves of trends, right, that we can feel on a day-to-day -day basis within life science. One is just technology and advances that have been made on the technical domain. So last week alone, I was flipping through the news space and, and journal articles, and there were two important announcements just in the last week alone. So one was that AlphaFold, so DeepMind, has finally predicted the entire um, space of proteins known to science. That's like hundreds of millions of proteins. So if you think about it, that's huge. That's enabled by computation. And imagine the amount of money that is saved. Because traditionally, if you do X-ray crystallography, it takes a lot of effort and at least $100,000 per protein. So you can compute what that means in terms of having this ability to, to look up on a lookup table or even input the sequence of a protein and get the structure back. That's transformational. And then the second piece uh, was that the UK Biobank, uh, they just sequenced 150,000 individuals, whole genome sequencing. That's also another technology trend that we should be aware of which is whole genome sequencing with sequencing costs coming down. There's just a lot of data. And with a lot of data, we now have the ingredients to derive insights. So that's just on the technology side. On the commercial side, if you think about big pharma, they now have chief data officers. That's a new thing. <laughs> so um, they are aware of this wave of data and computation coming. And so they are serious about it. And at the boardroom, People are talking about digital transformation left and right. And then third is policy. So um, the NIH and also Congress, when, when they passed the 21st Century Cures Act in 2016, they were onto something, digitizing healthcare information and now making it uh, shareable. Patients have, right, exactly. fingers crossed. Uh, patients now um, have the right to get their own healthcare data at no cost. So this, these different domains coming together, I think um, it is inevitable that data and computation will be the next underlying um, driver behind life sciences and healthcare generally. Certainly exciting points and, and excited to see how B Capital kind of fits in all of that as well. So moving forward, building on uh, everything that you've said so far, you and your team have made some incredible investments into companies such as Hotspot Therapeutics, uh, Triumvira Immunologics, Oncomix Therapeutics, and Carl's Med. Perhaps using these companies as examples, can you share more about the B Capital diligence process? How do you uniquely separate signal to noise when evaluating these companies? Yeah, so our diligence process also follows our investment thesis approach. So first we look at the technical robustness and we do deep diligence in that domain. And then beyond that, we also pay a lot of focus uh, or attention to the programs that they are developing, um, especially if uh, the platform companies, when they think about developing drugs, can the drugs really influence um, clinical outcomes? So this relates to the third bucket. So when we diligence, we look at many things. So technical safety efficacy when it comes to drugs, we look at uh, competitive landscape, we look at clinical development and regulatory pathways, and very important would be the team as well. So uh, team experience and the fact that they are cognizant of all the uh, 360 risks of developing drugs, we, we really play, uh, pay special attention to that. I'd love to give me both jump in here and ask Woody, especially coming from a BD background, having been a chief business officer in several companies, having been at J and J, and what you were talking about earlier with um, creative partnering and creative deal making, I would love your thoughts on BD as one of the elements, uh, especially from the early stages, where mm -hmm. we often see phenomenal technologists 
who might not necessarily know how to tell the stories of their technologies. Do you have any thoughts around um, maybe integrating that sort of BD and storytelling earlier into the process of startup companies? Yeah. So if you think about what can the company share with uh, be it investors or pharma partners, there are two. So one is they can sell their shares. This is equity. And then second, they can sort of sell their asset. So as a, as a startup company, you can think about whether you want to be diluted equity wise, or do you want to be diluted asset wise? So I think having that thinking uh, right from the beginning, if you're a platform company will help you navigate at what point will you go out to partner with the pharma versus raising capital from VC. But at the end of the day, this is an ecosystem again. And there is actually um, this published work last year in Nature Biotech that shows the impact of partnering with pharma and how that increases the, the probability of success of the company and also their exit value eventually. So it's, in telling the story though, equity investors versus uh, pharma partners, you have to tailor the stories differently. With pharma partners, you have to be, you have to do more specific targeting in terms of what is strategic to that pharma partner and then tailor the story according to that. Versus with equity investors, you have to know, you have to, um, to paint the picture in the sense that it is exciting, but also it's realistic and it is relevant uh, in the broader sense of the field. Wonderful. Uh, for our next question, um, do you have any recommendations for founders that are um, interested in reaching out to B Capital? We are pretty active out there. So reach out to any of us on LinkedIn. Um, we are everywhere on social media. And from that point, our team members will navigate and triangulate um, the, the startups and the entrepreneurs to reach to the appropriate place at B, uh, B Capital. So reach out to any one of us and reach out early. We would like to know uh, the company and so also get to know the individuals, the entrepreneurs behind each of the companies earlier so that we can start building that relationship. Great. I know you guys have an amazing website and are also um, active on Twitter. So that's, that's great for our listeners right. to know as well. Pivoting slightly, I'd love to dive into B Capital's platform of support for founders. What does being a good partner at your portfolio companies mean at B Capital? Yeah, so it, this is an important point for us. We want, again, we want to be the most value adding investor on the cap table. And I can dive now into the, the different elements of the platform team. So there are three major pillars. So one is strategy and operations. So you can rely on B Capital's platform team as you think about specific strategic uh, initiatives that you have, whether it's thinking about the new indications, uh, entering new markets or in digital health, how do you price your products? So that's one. And then second is capital advisory. So our team members uh, on the platform side, supporting companies uh, from the ca capital advisory point of view would guide entrepreneurs on how they should be thinking about their next fundraise. Should you, should you bring in debt? What are the benchmarks? So, um, or how even to think about IPO. So IPO readiness is something that is also um, new to startups usually. And this is something that we can provide support around. And then third is people and organization. How should, how should you, as you grow as a company, be thinking about your org design? How do you um, build that leadership capability right from the beginning? Uh, and also how to interact as a team. People have different personalities and different disciplines. And all of a sudden now you are, you are uh, parachuted in into a startup and a new environment. How do you work well together? So we have tools to help companies navigate that uh, dynamic. That's wonderful. Double clicking on your support surrounding people and organization. When we think about the lengthy life cycle of life sciences and healthcare, um, building teams and company culture with intention can be critical. Specifically in tech bio, where we're seeing an increase of interdisciplinary um, tech and biotech intersection. 
What do you think about supporting interdisciplinary teams and building long lasting company cultures at B Capital? Well, at B Capital, uh, we are by nature interdisciplinary, not just because we invest in so many domains, but also we are located, um, we're stationed around the world. So we have all kinds of people coming together to make um, the investment as well as portfolio support a reality. And with respect to the portfolio companies, I admire companies that, that pay attention to organizational health even very early on. So some of our portfolio companies have chief people officer and those, uh, those chief people officers are critical because especially as you are thinking about tech bio, you are usually combining two mindsets. I would say that the tech mindset is more abstract and they rely on uh, big data and let the, what the, let the patterns tell you what it is. Whereas the wet lab side of things, um, the life scientists usually they are they're motivated by understanding mechanism. So those two are quite different, even though they are solving the same problem. Um, so communication and also the style of understanding what the other person is thinking about, I think that that takes training too. So it doesn't come naturally, usually. Uh, but the good news is startups are usually, they are paddling in the same direction, hopefully, towards the same mission. So that that mission driving the various parts of the team. I think that is something that is going uh, for the startup, which helps. Certainly. Adding to the uh, tech and biotech intersection that you mentioned, there's also the business side that's involved as well. And so making sure that all of those um, different aspects can, can work together uh, very nicely is, is a huge part in, in venture capital. A point, and rightly, of particular focus and importance today is the diversity, equity, and inclusion of founders, boards, and teams. Given you see and support companies from the earliest stage, do you have any thoughts on how we as VCs can provide support to founders seeking to incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion into team building? Yeah, I think not, uh, not emphasizing diversity is a bad business decision or is a mistake. <laughs> Because no matter how you slice the numbers, and you can read reports from so many different firms, so VCG has a special report on this as well, no matter how you slice the numbers, diversity in the end will impact bottom line. And um, so this is a trickle effect, right? We have such a huge opportunity and honestly responsibility to instill this at the startup stage, because every single big company starts off as a startup. So, uh, and startups get resources from investors. And uh, it turns out to be that when you have a diverse VC firm, they tend to also invest in diverse teams of founders. And it turns out too that um, teams with more diversity, they raise more money in the later stages of the VC uh, fundraising journey. And they also get higher valuation. And so what does that mean? That turns into higher return on investment for the investors. And then even beyond that, if you think about long-term shareholder value, the profit margins of a more diverse team and an executive uh, management team is usually higher than if you had homogeneous teams. So it starts from the beginning and it trickles down. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I, I know personally, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent for diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, in the workspace, so that's that's really great to hear. Yeah, uh, and also one of my mentors said it is it should be called not a D and I, but mm -hmm. I and B, because if you're inclusive, then you're automatically diverse. That's I thought it was a subtle difference, but if you're inclusive and you you emphasize meritocracy, you will be automatically diverse. Yeah. So it should not be forced as diverse first, and then you have inclusion. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Very nice. Um, you've highlighted the partnership with BCG earlier in this conversation. We'd love to dive deeper. Can you share more details about how this partnership works? Maybe an example or two of how startups have been supported with this BCG uh, partnership. Yeah, so BCG, they have uh, partners that have been in various domains for their entire career. So with, within healthcare specifically, there are several things that are 
uh, important as well as value adding to our portfolio companies. On the life sciences side, getting that visibility into how the big pharma clients of BCG are thinking about the next generation of therapeutics, which indications, how do you think about the commercial landscape has been very helpful in addition to getting that introductions to, to the big pharma companies. Um, aside from that, the partners themselves have been at, acting as advisors in certain instances to our portfolio companies so they can deliver direct feedback and guidance throughout the startup journey. Um, and beyond portfolio company specific thinking, uh, BCG has also been a great partner for us as we think about investment thesis development and in some cases also helping out in diligence. So we know it's near impossible to choose, but lastly on portfolio support, are there any companies you'd like to highlight? Yeah, it is nearly impossible to choose, but maybe just to bring home one more point about how we invest, which is in addition to the primary uh, competitive advantage of a company, we also pay attention to the secondary competitive advantage it might not be their special sauce, but they need to be thinking about the secondary um, competitive advantage. And I can bring up two examples of our portfolio companies. One is hotspot therapeutics. So their primary advantage is in using artificial intelligence and also proprietary um, chemical libraries to come up with allosteric medicines targeting difficult to target targets. So that's their primary advantage. Their secondary advantage as they're thinking about progressing their uh, drugs into the clinic was precision medicine. So they do that through partnerships. And in this specific instance, they partner with Caris Life Science, which is a leader in thinking about molecular uh, precision oncology. So that's one example. I can bring another example, which is Triumvira Immunologics. So in this case, the primary advantage is cell therapy and coming up with this tech construct, which is an alternative to a car, um, to really activate T cells in a natural way to target solid tumors. So that's their primary advantage. The second uh, competitive advantage would be manufacturing. And again, this is done in collaboration with the best in the industry, which is Lonza. So Triumvira and Lonza, they have this partnership centered around the cocoon system to make cell manufacturing more streamlined, more automated, more reliable and scalable. So uh, I would just highlight those two examples and hopefully it's, it's helpful for, for our audience to think about or to, to hear about how we are investing in companies. I would say it definitely is. And it's also interesting especially when, as we think about your career, from the beginning of your time, not only with B Capital, but the beginning of your time with McKinsey and through J&J &J in the startup space, you've had a very future forward, and I would say tech-enabled investment perspective. So we've talked about this briefly, but I would love to hear what you've been seeing from founders in terms of the next cycle of emerging technologies. would really just be so curious to know what you're most excited by personally. Yeah, so we're standing at this point in history where there is just so much knowledge that has been created. Mm -hmm. So founders have been um, very resourceful and, and also very smart in really not just standing on the shoulders of giants, but also just seeing what is what has been discovered and mixing and matching different um, insights to create something new. So if you think about cell therapy 2.0, or even degraders, it is really piecing together what has been known before to create something better. So I'm starting to see more and more of that and also leveraging data pieces or layers that uh, were not known before because of tools not being available a few years ago. So I spoke a bit about whole genome sequencing, but now we are seeing proteomics, we are seeing metabolomics. And so entrepreneurs and scientists, innovators, um, also in partnership with data scientists and computational biologists, they are really peeling back new layers and insights of biology to speed up this drug 
discovery. And I would say we should stop using the, the phrase drug discovery at this point. It should be drug engineering because it should not rely on luck anymore. So hopefully with all these pieces combined, we can really speed up and uh, make better drugs. Talk about storytelling. I love that phrase, drug engineering. <laughs> I think uh, it's, it's definitely fine. something that I hope we see more of recently, because as you point out, especially with things like advanced computation, the development of all these data sources, and really the advancements in high throughput platforms, I think things are really changing and drug engineering is definitely a more apt phrase for some of these new age comp tech bio companies. Yeah, it should not rely on serendipity anymore at this stage. Well, turning that around, and I know this is also going to be a more difficult question. Uh, is there anything you're more bearish on? Or you think, maybe to rephrase it more delicately, do you think that just needs a little bit more time to really come to the main stage? Yeah, this is a tough question. Uh, so I'm not too excited by technologies that would perpetuate the brokenness of our industry and <laughs> healthcare system. So uh, <laughs> one example would be technologies that encourage patent evergreening, right? Reformulation and all these incremental, but you know, there is some financial incentives that are perverse. They are technologies directed to those things, but we should not be doing that. At least that's that's my perspective on this. So not too excited about the things that perpetuate the inefficiency and the, the expensive nature of healthcare. I think healthcare inequities are something we would all love to find a way to address a little bit more directly. And today, and we've talked about this a bit, but we're seeing a lot of innovation, not only on the science side of life sciences and healthcare, but also on the business side. And that innovation at times can be almost ahead of the market especially when we think about increasing that access and in some ways the commoditization of healthcare. Especially given your background as a CBO, would really love to hear your thoughts as we think about go-to-market strategies and company journeys for these next wave of bio-IT startups. Yeah, I think this is where sitting at B Capital, where we have both sides of the equation in healthcare investing mm -hmm. is terribly uh, helpful in thinking about how we bridge the scientific advancement and finally getting to that last mile delivery of healthcare. So um, it is, there is still quite a gap, but um, as patients get more vocal, I think that that gap is starting to be bridged and uh, consumerization of healthcare is a thing and it is coming. Mm -hmm. um, so from the startup perspective, if you're developing cutting edge technology, do not forget the perspective of the patients and the physicians. So some startups have been quite at the cutting edge of involving that patient advocacy thinking into how they, they develop drug. So go to market, I think that is quite relevant. And then on the health tech side, delivery of care, I think that's easier to think about because now uh, care is delivered to the home more and more and COVID has been a catalyzing force behind this. But yeah, going into the, the more uh, drug discovery or engineering side of things, we, we still have a lot of work to do. No, and it also goes back, as you said, as we've talked about, B Capital has its people and organization arm uh, for support of startups. And in a recent conversation with Lee Cooper, he was actually making the point like you were saying, sometimes you need a chief people officer early. It really makes a difference. He was making the point, why isn't there a chief patient officer? To really right. think about how do we make sure these perspectives are included, especially as we get closer and closer to interacting more directly with those patients. And that was something I thought was brilliant. So like uh, you're saying, I think there's a lot we can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's project that out even further. Uh, it's 2040 now, maybe even 2050. Do you have any calls for startups and what you'd love to see them uh, help us reach a few decades from now? Yeah, so I don't want to be cliched, but I'll, I'll bring up this quote that everybody knows that the future is here. Yeah. It is just not equally distributed. So if you think about that statement alone, right? Um, and thinking about how we operate as the life science industry, last mile or last cell, last inch delivery is still a challenge. And I would encourage startups to start thinking about that. 
So from the drug delivery perspective, getting to the right cell, even the right compartment within a cell, it is still a challenge. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's from the uh, technical drug engineering perspective. And then reaching every single patient. So rare diseases, there are but now 7,000 uh, rare diseases that we know of. There are many more, I'm sure. And collectively, they represent 10% of the population. So it's not that rare. But how can we deliver drugs and also treatments that would be life-changing for those rare disease patients? And then third, just thinking about the world's population as you go beyond uh, the Western world and the Northern Hemisphere, the drugs that are so amazing, they're here now. They are not accessible to those people. So um, I would encourage startups to start thinking about those problems. And at the same time, by 2040, maybe eventually at that point, this concept of precision medicine can be personalized at the point of care. So that takes a lot of innovation, not just from a drug engineering perspective, but also manufacturing and logistics. As you said, it's not just about the engineering and that last mile isn't just in terms of drug delivery, it's also access for patients as well. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a very, I hope, I hope by 2040, we're seeing the same vision. Uh, yeah, we have 20 years. It's a long and a short time to cut. <laughs> uh, and let's, let's keep, let's keep projecting out then. What's coming next for B Capital? What's coming next? So we are continuing to look for entrepreneurs that are shaping and changing the world through technology. And uh, we are not the technical experts. We are not the technologists. So we really rely on the innovators out there in the world to reach out to us as they continue in this journey. So what's next for B Capital? We continue to back and look for transformative uh, entrepreneurs wanting to change the world, not just here in the US, but also globally. I love that message. So before we come to a close, a few rapid fire questions just to cap things off. Personally, you've traversed such a breadth of roles across the bioinnovation landscape. Do you have any advice for people earlier in their careers who are seeking to pursue maybe entrepreneurship or continue to support bioinnovation themselves? Yeah, so one is courage. <laughs> this stuff is not easy. So there will be twists and turns, ups and downs. Uh, so having that courage to pursue your dream is, it should be a constant in somebody's mindset. Mm -hmm. And the second is candor, because uh, transparency, again, is so important. You will have to rely on so many partners and supporters in this journey. So uh, there will be good news, there will be bad news, but uh, having that candid exchange sooner than later, even though it means bad news in the short term, will put you in a good position in this long-term journey so that, you, you know, that trust and, and resource will continue pouring into your startup. And then thirdly, well, growth well. mindset. <laughs> yeah, you cannot do this alone. So continue expanding your horizon uh, as you transition from maybe a technical founder to finally a, a leader and manager. You need a lot of people around you. Mm -hmm. So you also need to develop faster than your startup. Startups themselves are so fast moving, but they rely on the, the leader on top to be upskilling constantly to keep up. I'm going to take this then and drill down into that point because I think you're bringing up something really important. There are so many, especially for early stage organizations, nucleates out there, we have so many accelerators for people earlier in their careers who are seeking to launch companies, or even people later seeking to do the same with like Combinator and other groups. But there are so few, if any, formal programs around how do you as a founder grow and develop and upskill with your startup? Do you have any thoughts on how we as VCs can do our part to support those founders as they continue to grow, not just their companies, but also themselves? Yes, so this is an underappreciated uh, problem, really, of uh, growing to be a leader within your organization. So, um, yeah, at B Capital, the people and org support 
works with CEOs to help them upscale. But as a venture community, I think beyond just focusing on uh, progress and growth and revenues and all these uh, milestones, we should also be thinking about how do we support the CEO and their management team? They're people too, and they need to continue learning. So having more resources directed to that uh, as a venture community, I think that's where the impact can be felt. That makes a lot of sense. Would love to find a way to even work together on something like that. Yeah, but yeah absolutely. Let, let's take it a step further. Uh, you've been on both sides of the table, founder and CBO, pharma and investor, and talking about helping upskill founders. And this is business oriented, but do you have any advice for founders seeking to engage with pharma? Yeah, in the end, um, this partnership is about matchmaking. And matchmaking, there is a lot of information asymmetry involved in it. Uh, so for <laughs> I think for someone recently reach... talked about candor and the importance of candor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, because uh, you know so much about your startups. It's your responsibility as entrepreneurs to also know who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. So before you reach out to pharma, do your diligence. And in fact, I think that that uh, approach should be should be used as you reach out to investors also. Um, but especially important because pharma companies they have strategic directions, so it is about matching um, what their targeted shopping list is. But at the end of the day, it's also listening to feedback coming from the pharma companies because they are um, usually. They will tell you these are the criteria before you are interesting uh, for a partnership. So take notes of those things and not just talk to one, talk to several and see if they converge to a specific list, a list of wish list. So that would, that would help you as you prioritize your own scarce resources to finally check all the boxes for partnering. No, I love that. And it's, it reminds me of the old uh, cliche, if you want advice, ask for money. And if you want money, ask for advice. <laughs> it sounds almost fitting in this situation where- Yeah, that's a good maybe, one. <laughs> maybe at this point, the proper way to start is ask a few pharma companies for advice and then see if there's alignment and who knows, maybe it turns into a partnership. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, turning that around then. What about offering advice? Again, you've been on both sides. Do you have any advice for pharma companies who might be listening and seeking to get earlier in their collaborations with innovation? Right. Yeah, this is the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. So as a pharma search and evaluation person, for example, you should be uh, crystal clear in terms of what you would like to see. So that's just to return the favor because Again, in my mind, it's just information exchange and trying to see where there are overlaps between the two sides. It makes sense. And we've talked a lot about the professional. Love to ask something personal and simply, how do you like to spend your free time? <laughs> yeah, I like to be outside. I like hiking, biking. Um, I also grew up uh, playing some music instrument, but I have not touched <laughs> one. In a long time, so in my free time, I would like to do more of that. But yeah, for now, I'm just enjoying the summer and, and being outside. I'm oh, glad you're taking the time to enjoy the weather. And uh, you put it out there. The audience knows. We're going to come back and ask how the prog progress with your musical <laughs> music instruments are going. <laughs> <laughs> no, and any other closing thoughts, what do you have, shameless plugs, things you'd like to share with the audience? Shameless plug, just reach out to us. We would like to hear from you. So no, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you for your work bringing this community together. I've been a big fan of the BIOS platform and community, so thank you. Thank you too, Widya. It's only through people like yourselves coming on that we're all able to keep supporting each other and moving forward. And I'm excited to keep working. I know we both are excited to keep working with you to keep building not only BIOS, but also bio innovation broadly. So thank you for the conversation today for an absolutely fantastic episode. And excited to have you back sometime soon. Oh, thank you.